session on future programming. Uh, this is an open session in a sense that we do not have really an agenda for this. Uh, we have uh, all of you uh, who want to speak, so please signal to me that you want to take the floor because the idea is really to come up with meaningful suggestions out of the very important, very thorough uh, discussion we had until now in the, during this conference in terms of future activities. Where would you like to be uh, seeing the Academy involved? What programs, which projects do you think that we can cope with, knowing realistically that we cannot do everything and that uh, the interest of the Academy is still to have interconnected programs? Um, the intertwined programs where you can, uh, we can collaborate, all of us, from different perspectives. So the multidisciplinary approach remains uh, the, the valid one. We, I think we all agree with that. Uh, but there are many, many initiatives that go beyond what we have already in place. Um, so I would like to give the floor to the first one that wants to speak. Please raise your hand. The session is open. Yeah. David, please go okay. ahead. It's um, been an incredible week with incredible people. Um, and I think a lot of progress has been made. Some of the progress, I think, has been in positivity with all the problems we're facing all over the world. Um, it, my, my commitment is to the anticipation. That's why I see this whole week as a foresight exercise. We are trying to create space for WAS not to build back better, but to build forward better and do it together. Uh, it's the reason I and, and colleagues that I work with in Canada and, and overseas, particularly in Asia, uh, believe that the issue of human security needs a rebranding to humanity security. How many times this week have we heard the subject humanity? Human security is a part, and, and some days a small part. When we look at things like climate change and uh, nuclear weapons and things, it's just so, so small compared to some of the other immediate acute threats. COVID-19 is one of them. My country has not done well uh, for a host of reasons. One, unfortunately, is because we're a democracy. And the way our politics works is uh, fragmented. We are a provincial country. And that has caused us a great deal of problems. Uh, and the fragmentation has meant that there's been no shared anticipation of what to do. Um, my first recommendation, again, is that we work on our project on human security uh, under the rubric of humanity security. And I'm creating an essay, a long essay to do that shortly. My other issue has always been when I was chair of Canadian Pugwash, not bringing youth into the organization, but making the organization all generational. Some of you might have seen my note a little while ago. Um, this isn't an intergenerational problem. We're all in this generation together, 2021, young, old, north, south, east, west, uh, regardless of color or orientation or anything. This is a generational problem we all are in together. And therefore, another recommendation is that WAS, in its bylaws, with its anticipation committee, rename the committee the Foresight Committee, and that that Foresight Committee be directed by the likes of the Youth Leadership Network. And we will all be in it together, all of us in it together. Um, I would like to participate in that, but I think that is really possible. And my last hope is that the human security does not fall by the wayside as it has so often in the past. I've been involved with it since the Human Development Report in 1994. And I think of how many organizations in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, never mentioned it. 
the responsibility to protect, the global compact, uh, John Ruggie's framework for human uh, business and human security. Um, yeah, th there were many, many. So I'm hoping that someday someone will make a move to have a undersecretary general of the UN or equivalent office for the security development goals. We still have 10 years, nine and a half years, but there's got to be a focal point with clout. I, I didn't say power. I said clout um, in the United Nations to shepherd all the efforts to make the sustainable development goals a real issue. And that can be done very, very easily. Doesn't cost any money. We have the power here in WAS to suggest that strongly. Strategic foresight, you know, your catalytic converter in your car, it would just be a big can if it didn't have platinum, palladium. So the catalytic strategies that WAS has called for, I think, need the catalyst of strategic foresight. Thank you. Uh, yes. Next to you, next year, please take over, uh, Gary, you. because I don't think okay. I can continue with these technologies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Congratulate you. you all on what a fantastic event it's been this week, and I've been so delighted to be part of it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I participated in a few, but the one I'm reporting on is the Global Institute for, Ho for Human Security, uh, where I was a participant yesterday. Um, as you know, we had a great panel um, of people who have been involved in think tanks, in academia, in looking at human security. Um, I think if I step back from it, though, the crux of it is the world is in a transition of civilizations. And so we have unprecedented challenges. Uh, no one would expect America's capital to be raided by a mob. Um, no one would expect a pandemic to, to expose the lack of resilience on the planet. No one would expect that Asia would come out and develop, developing countries would come out stronger than the West. So things are shaken beyond what we imagined and a futurist could have predicted in terms of how fragile the world seems to be. In terms of the need, therefore, for an institute that looks at security, it seems very appropriate right now to do that. Um, there are some questions as to whether it's human security, humanity, or planetary, and whether these are just the same things on a spectrum and we need to reconcile them to find the whole answer. Um, so there, there were a few points I'll, I'll outline in terms of what was discussed. So the first is the scope uh, for human dignity and material possessions, um, and to deliver that is one end of the spectrum, and the other end of the spectrum is the existential risk to the species. Um, and, and that is the result of the big changes in the world and technologies in particular that could change the way the species and its survival plays out. So that was one part of the, of the scope that should be considered as part of the Institute. The second is that the Institute would be a trustee, a holding entity, if you like, for security, human humanity and planetary security. Allied to that is the idea that the Institute would sit in the middle of the flow of information, thinking, solutions, and implementation regarding security. I'll, I'll use the word human security, but I think it's still to be determined whether it's human, humanity, or planetary. Fourth, the Institute would insource the thinking as required from the best minds and institutes across the world. It has no monopoly on ideas and it doesn't pretend to be funded to think of all the things that humanity need to think about. And so it would collaborate and be a nexus for, for this collaboration with other great minds around the world, and other great institutes. And then it would solicit this, the solutions to these challenges and opportunities to enhance security. It would not assume that it could generate the solutions itself or be funded to do so. But there's an important distinction here to be made, which is it's not just about the challenges, which are more just based on fears, but also on the opportunities to create something new, a new civilization. The Institute would then commission or create the conditions for solutions to be developed 
and to be implemented by those that are best suited to implement it. So it is about action, it is about solutions, about measuring them, but it's the commissioner as opposed to somebody who has all the implement implementation skills in-house. So it would engage or cause to be interested to, to get engaged the sources of also capital to finance this execution, which will be public, sovereign, uh, and other, and private. Um, and here the, the, the footnote would be that 90% of the world's money sits in the hands of non-governmental institutions. So uh, not NGOs in that sense, but private financial institutions, not sovereign capital. And the Institute's role, therefore, as, as the final point, would be to understand, prioritize, and ensure the positive enhancement through initiatives that impact human humanity and planetary security, but not carry the burden of knowing everything, creating all the solutions, or implementing everything. It's not a think tank, therefore, but a conscious facilitating and enabling hand in the affairs of humanity on the planet for security. So that was the, um, the richness, I think, of the dialogue. If I could possibly summarize it in three to five minutes, that would be it. Thank you, Kitan. I just would uh, add to that that uh, this is very, very close to what Michael has just presented to us. The only difference is we talked about going further than just looking at the, the diplomacy or the policy side as well as the science. We talked about actually getting in the stakeholders who would be involved in implementation to try to anticipate all of the steps down to action, even though we are not an implementing. We didn't conceive of it as an implementing agency. We conceived that the design should take into account all of the stages down to implementation. But in the same spirit, just a little further, but they're further ahead, they're actually doing it. Thank you very much for that. Call on Kathleen Walter, who was the, the last in line who we didn't get to uh, last time we got to David, but not Kathleen. Uh, and then we will continue on the discussion about specific proposals. Kathleen? Uh, good evening, everyone. And, and thank you, Gary, and everyone for this amazing session. Uh, the comment I had was very, very brief when we were talking about proposals to get the communications out and the thoughts uh, exponentially reaching the world, places where... Um, WAS is maybe partially known, but, but the name recognition is, is, is not yet as known as, as people would like it to be, and especially intergenerationally. And, and the thought that I had is something which we're doing to promote entrepreneurship across the African continent. And um, my principal is one of the top entrepreneurs on the continent, and, he, and one of his callings is to mentor young people uh, across the African continent. And he does it through social media, and he's been the number one on Facebook uh, social media influencer for the just over four years now, as far as measured by engagement. And uh, sometimes it's measured weekly, and sometimes uh, Zuckerberg uh, bumps us aside, but generally uh, we're number one, which is quite unusual because he has a lot more money to work with, and Bill Gates and Branson and others are some of the influencers. And it's, it's a knack to know how to promote to reach the demographics, the young people you want to reach. So that was the one thing. Your social media has been really great this week, but there might be a way to target it to reach new demographics with new messages. And the second was the use of podcasts. Um, I think that if, if, I don't know if the young people would be interested, and I don't know if the fellows have time, but I think it would be so interesting to have intergenerational podcasts, a series uh, whatever it's named, something zippy. We have one that's called Afropreneur Talk, and it's it's linking young entrepreneurs with senior entrepreneurs, and they have a chat. It's usually about twenty minutes, and and then we can reach people in new ways through audio, and and they're not very expensive to produce. They do take some time, but I know with all these very clever young people um, that are involved. I'm sure that they've possibly already discussed this. So that's what I wanted to raise as a way to reach more people and to reach it across generations. And thank you for everything and everyone's words. It's been very inspiring. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Okay, I, next I have Mila and then uh, um, Lydia and then Carlo and Yehuda. Mila? 
Uh, thank you so much. I mean, it would be a perfect follow-up to speak right after Kitan because he gave the larger framework about human security and he spoke about the initiative to organize those forces and resources by having a place that can connect and convene uh, all the initiatives that can actually go within that larger framework or meta framework, if, if, if you will. Uh, one of the proposals uh, as part of that uh, is the uh, initiative on, on global referendum or polling. We have not uh, decided just yet how that's going to uh, be named, granted that to speak of an, a referendum, it would mean that it's a legally binding voting process. Polling is something else, but most, what is most important about this initiative and this proposal is the picture it wants to paint and that we would like to, an initiative we would like to facilitate actually. And it would entail um, building global consensus and activating global consciousness across and beyond socioeconomic and political divisions. Rather, that would mean to provide a voice for humanity, a platform, a way of supporting um, channeling the voice of humanity, uh, uh, addressing universal needs and aspirations. Um, in that sense, um, we have discussed in our session all the details and all the different aspects of, of what that would entail, uh, anywhere from what kind of mechanism we would need to have, obtaining information, projecting viewpoints, voting on key issues of relevance to global society, what kind of technology. Um, we think the best solution probably would be a blockchain-based system um, accessible by um, mobile phone app to provide security and limit voting on any issue to one voter per unique mobile phone number. Um, in that domain of designing uh, a technological pathway, we have collaborated closely with our dear fellow, uh, Mariana Todorva, who's I think here with us and her um, organization, her company, DG Agora. She has a rich um, experience as a politician, scientist, and a leader, futurist, uh, leader in technology. So we have a perfect combination uh, for a partnership and, and fellowship, which she generously offers her expertise and her resources to actually have already built the base of, of technology for it. Um, of course, the discussion of what kind of platform it would be, a liquid democracy platform to disseminate inform information, facilitate discussion and enable voting by millions or tens of millions, hopefully. Um, the question next of who participates, what would be the representative uh, a group to represent uh, uh, the, these issues, what would be considered as a representative sample, and of course, what benefits would emerge out of it, what kind of output, who would benefit and what that would mean. Um, granted, like I said, that this is not a legally binding process at this time, especially because electronic voting is not something that's available in all the countries. But the value of it would be to paint a picture, if you will, to have a picture of humanity emerge and a voice of humanity be heard that's undeniable and undeniably uniting um, in its universal needs and aspirations uh, so that socioeconomic and political divisions can no longer impose, be imposed on us. In practical terms, it would be um, useful information, useful statistics and, and feedback, right? Global feedback to international organizations, to scientific communities and statistics, to media, most importantly, to be able to um, vocalize and articulate back, translate that message back to humanity around our, uh, like I said, universal needs and aspirations. And to round this off, um, some of the specific aspects of what we have discussed in the group coming from the entire collective intelligence we had in the panel were propositions uh, uh, on identity, scope, and scale of the refer referendum. And, and parts of that are um, consideration of a global consciousness and conscience beyond borders, um, and to the edges of, of mainstream societies, of course, um, a media platform in scale and reach that allows us to express ourselves beyond Facebook's 2.8 billion to get to 7.5 billion, hopefully, a platform likely the most valuable that would be in the world, potentially owned by all the people of the world. So a truly democratic open source, a convergence of collective intelligence, a political social force beyond governments, 
and a collaborative platform to catalyze change for good to solve problems. These are all the aspects and perspectives that we have considered or played with in the panel, but most importantly, what came out of that panel, as in all other um, forums and discussions that we have led on this topic, is the immediate mobilization of enthusiasm, energy, and expertise and willingness to collaborate. I think that is probably the best way, uh, way to gauge the validity of this proposal because anywhere from the proposition that we made at the uh, Global Leadership uh, Conference in Geneva, um, where uh, Director General Tatiana Valovaya actually singled out that initiative all the way to checking it with people um, across disciplines and regions and partnerships all the way to where we are today, present moment, where people understood the value, the magnitude, unprecedented opportunity to facilitate providing a voice for humanity uh, at these times of the greatest divisions. So this is an incredible opportunity for the World Academy, like I said, either to lead it or facilitate it or both. But my invitation to you is that you uh, reach out to us um, and let us know who wants to collaborate and disseminate the information. The first part of this project probably was already prototyped and launched through the work that Gary and Donato have been leading uh, in collaboration with the United Nations Human Security Unit uh, by sending out a survey on some of these things. But th this specifically went to NGOs uh, out there to test these questions, but test them in an um, institutionalized way. And we have already been, like I said, to sum it up, um, looking at the technology and exploring that, looking at the means of dissemination, prototyping surveys. So we're in full uh, movement and development of the project, but it's gonna take all of us to actually be able to disseminate this across the world. And I hope this will be a, a truly a genuine co a contribution that we can uh, launch at WAS at 60. Thank you, Mela. Uh, this would uh, dwarf anything else we're talking about right now. Uh, but we have, and whether we will come up with the concept and give it away to somebody who's got more capabilities or we will end up pioneering it, that's all to be seen. But I'd just like to acknowledge we have Cyril Ritchie here, who's the, uh, the uh, honorary chairman or past president of, uh, of Congo, which is one of our partners. We've already had close discussions with them. There's great deal of enthusiasm about it. So we are going beyond the mere sketching to see who our partners could be. But we have a long way to go uh, in, in taking it forward. But those who are interested or have ideas, it would be very welcome. And I just wanted to mention that this idea was first uh, voiced in the second issue of Cadmus uh, when uh, 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 Agni, um, um, from Athens wrote and had this idea about a global referendum. And Evo and I picked it up and wrote an editorial about it in the second issue of Cadmus. Uh, but we never, we didn't know how to make a, a break at that time, the technology wasn't ready. So anyway, thank you Mila for uh, a very concise uh, presentation. Uh, now I'd like to call on uh, Lydia, uh, uh, who was the rapporteur for our session, which David Chick might say uh, presented uh, uh, on multilateralism and civil society. It was a wonderful session, dynamic session. Lydia, thank you for coming. Thank you, Gary. Uh, hello and greetings to everybody, to Donato, to Mila, and to all the other colleagues from the UN office at Geneva. Um, yes, I attended the session on the role of civil society in multilateral system. Um, this panel examined how the multilateral system could be strengthened through the enhancement of the participation and contributions of civil society organizations in addressing global challenges. And while I will not uh, attempt to summarize the very, very rich panel discussions, which very much mirror with what already has been said in this session previously, let me just briefly focus on uh, some uh, ideas and recommendations that are stemming from this panel. And the starting point is uh, that the diverse voices of civil society and uh, non-governmental organizations 
bring uh, critical contributions to the multilateral system and influence better outcomes for all. Various actors in multilateralism, member states, but also local authorities, the private sector, the media, the academia, and others should be more educated about the role and importance and value of civil society. And vice versa, there is also a need for better informing civil society actors about the ways to engage and contribute to multilateral discussions and decisions. Then uh, there was uh, underlined a need for better coordination among democratic states at the international level for greater civic space. And the establishment of a so-called democracy caucus could be envisaged and advocated for. In addition, member states with a track record of enabling civil society participation could be encouraged to actively seek membership in critical UN bodies and mechanisms, such as uh, that one mentioned the ECOSOC and GEO Committee and uh, the Human Rights Council and others. Another idea that emerged was of a civil society envoy that could be considered at the UN level to enable the organization's engagement with civil society and the increase uh, of uh, its capacity for engagement with civil society. Uh, it was also recommended that different parts of the UN uh, should actively promote and use civil society as experts, uh, as multipliers, educators, and uh, monitors of the situations on the ground. Uh, modalities for civil society engagement in multilateral fora should be made uh, more predictable, transparent, and consistent across the system. Um, and that processes should become more open for access and for input. That recommendation was coming out very strongly. In addition, there were two existing initiatives that were recommended for active uh, engagement and promotion. One that Mila was already mentioning before is uh, a survey for NGOs on human security, which is conducted by WAS in collaboration with, uh, with Congo, um, also on behalf of the UN uh, Trust Fund for Human Security. And the second initiative that was highlighted was the We the People's UN World Citizens Initiative, which aims to give uh, citizens a voice, uh, um, more voice at the United Nations. And finally, um, the United Nations Secretary General's report on uh, UN 75, Shaping Our Future Together, was recognized by uh, panelism as the foundation underpinning uh, the way forward in these initiatives. So that's a very brief summary of a very, very rich discussion. So I hope I made some justice to the session. Thank you, Gary, over to you. Lydia, thank you so much for this excellent, superb summary. And we have other participants here. I, I have listened to it again, it was so rich. Uh, and I wanted to mention the importance of this is because this is one of the issues that we're trying to address in our final report uh, on the global leadership in the 21st century. And we have other people in the academy who have some experience in this area. And if anyone else has other recommendations that you'd like to pass on to us, please do contact me uh, after the end of this, not tonight. <laughs> uh, and uh, because uh, we, are, we still have a, a month or so before we finish our final report. And I really think uh, this is a key area for the UN and the Secretary General knows it and wants it. And, uh, we need information from inside the system and outside the system on both sides. So thank you very much. That was great. And then Carlo, I see uh, uh, you're next in line. Please join us. Thank you very much, Gary. And I also want to thank all the speakers uh, that have preceded me because I always have, uh, I always see that I can learn a lot from each discussion I'm involved in, and I'm very thankful to the World Academy for this great stage. Um, I have participated to um, the session on how to increase WAS's global impact from uh, the side of junior fellows and youth, especially. And um, what David said before about uh, that we're all the same generation. It's a uh, very, it's a great um, concept. And we often say that we are, we want to achieve intergenerational um, partnerships, but we are all part uh, of the same world. We all are on the same boat. So that's why we really want to strengthen 
our collaboration um, between youth and experts uh, in in each field. So in my um, in my session, we had uh, some very interesting proposals. Um, as Kathleen was saying before, uh, we mentioned podcasts. We mentioned participating in um, social media. That's uh, two fields where junior fellows and uh, the youth wants uh, to collaborate really with uh, the World Academy. But also um, we had uh, this idea of creating a mutual mentorship program between youth and experts because we deeply believe that uh, we have uh, many different ideas that we can share that we uh, can discuss and that's how we can move forward to have a, a, a complemental strategy between experts and youth. And um, I am part of the Youth Leadership Network. We uh, are, uh, one of our objectives is to give uh, a stronger particip participation for youth in such meetings in such um, events uh, as this was conference. And um, just after our uh, session, we, we junior fellows immediately created a WhatsApp group on how we can move forward, how we can uh, think of new strategies. We really want to dive deep into these uh, proposals. And um, we would also love to reconstruct the editorial board of Eruditio. That's, uh, I know, Gary, that's one of your suggestions and we really would love to, to work on this also. So um, I am really thrilled about this, uh, these possibilities that we have that we can achieve together. And we are, um, we're working every day to, to take our own future and we would like to share it with you take it together, work together. So thank you. Carlo, thank you so much, because I'm equally thrilled, and I think we all are. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great opportunity for all of us. And this idea of the, the, the dual mentoring, I right? you didn't use exactly that term, but I like uh, what you said. Uh, the, the, the secret that I found is that you learn the most when you try to teach somebody else. So it, it's not fair that, uh, <laughs> that the, the people who are supposed to mentor get all the benefit. The benefit should go in both directions. So that by all means, let's, let's do it. And I can tell you an area where we stand in line for help is simply how to communicate in the network world and how to reach out to people. We, need, we have a lot to learn uh, and uh, we need your active participation for sure. Thank you so much to, oh, and to you and the whole team our junior fellows and all uh, all those who have started up this wonderful new organization. Next we have Yehuda Wiraga. Soul Bones. Man, we are chasing is saints of an era. It's time to ascend the saints the model. Two, the national encountering should be changed to be great long term values and not simply economically financing the SDGs. The region but but agreements to pass to private companies. So, to start thinking about jobs and pensions through the millennials is to shine to, to labyrinths with Kitan Patel. Thank you, Yehuda. And Yehuda, we had a, a note from Yehuda on this issue, and we'll be happy to circulate it 
uh, to other members. Uh, thank you so much for the for your presentation. I want to observe always all my speech. Be, be, uh, it's getting better every day. Thanks so much. You're so dedicated to sharing. Okay, then Frank and uh, now, please go ahead, Frank. Oh, thanks, Gary. Uh, Yehuda, it was great to hear from you. I, I love speaking with you and Dubrovnik, and it's really great to see you here with us. Thank you. Um, we, Julene and I, chaired a panel on culture and system change yesterday that uh, went very well. And at the end, we recommended setting up a future transformations forum. So I'll kind of just give the foundation uh, for it, and then Julene will talk about the activities that we were suggesting uh, that WASP engages in along with us. Um, the, the basis of it is something that we've been discussing throughout this panel, and that is that humanity faces major challenges, and these result from our mainly our reductionistic thinking and the inevitably flawed economic and political systems that result from it. These force companies uh, to degrade the environment and society. So system change is perhaps the most important action needed to resolve challenges and and uh, achieve the SDGs and get humanity to sustainability, sustainability in real processes. It's a complex challenge with whole system change. It includes all aspects of humanity. So it, it really, everything is a sub element of system change in that sense. It requires uh, clear frameworks and roadmaps for how humanity can get to sustainable society. What are the system changes needed? What are the actions needed to bring them about? And we also need clear, effective processes for managing uh, collaborative system change efforts. We had a number of experts on our panelists who talked about successful system change work they're already doing. There's a lot of great things being done out there. The key issue is how can you possibly bring all this together into one coordinated effort? And it's probably impossible, but we're going to at least try and come up with some helpful items. So uh, the, 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 the basic idea is that and we're, we're, we suggest being very focused on practicality and, and less on theory, because um, it seems that we our systems are already breaking down. We've systems change through voluntary or involuntary means. Usually, it's involuntary, and it seems that our systems are in the process of collapsing with COVID, with the insanity in the U.S. government. Um, so. Uh, w w to, to, to move it forward, we're suggesting a number of actions in an online and other types of uh, other types of activities. So, Julene, do you want to describe those? Yeah, so we, um, once again, it was a wonderful panel, lots of incredible experts. Um, and we're also talking about running this in a different modus operandi, right? So defining the nature of participation and engaging um, transformative participation. So creative processes are being baked in from the very beginning, not an artistic performance on the side, but in fact, creativity being built in micro, mezzo, macro structured into the participation. So micro action being what everyday people can do every day, mezzo being organizational level and macro being international law policy, right? So an actual systemic framework for involving multiple levels of participation. Um, and the second is key information flows um, for the way that we set this up. So we don't wanna be isolated in a silo. I think people even with the best of intentions end up in their specialist groups. So we're gonna be deciding what are these key information flows. Um, we have um, artistically and culturally um, access to um, thousands of groups. We have in fact have databases of, of artistic action and cultural action with on the ground groups dealing with this. So the key thing is to keep in mind the on, on the ground realities, but also using art as a lens of knowledge, understanding arts and culture as a social knowledge system for seeing um, everyday realities, lived experiences, and working with Nora Bateson's work on examining art in the interrelational multidimensional lens. Because in fact that we know when we engage um, arts and culture, that's when um, social movements can really gain momentum. That's how you can take it from the local 
to the global. And there, there's been processes outlined um, about that in my work, but also other ones put forward. Um, so essentially, we're talking about a system for which um, we can identify our goals, essentially of aligning human and natural systems, but also our interdependent goals and creating a framework of new narratives, new processes, identifying new institutional, institutional change, M models, mentalities um, that we can work with, working on both the behavioral, um, cultural um, side, addressing mindsets, but also in the structural change. Um, like I said, identifying our, our the shared goal goals of systems change for aligning social and natural systems, but the um, interdependent goals. And I think the benefit of, of, of working in this way also is that you can translate a lot of the the work that was is done, um, implementing it by region or by industry sector. So we can do just a systems change project for um, education. What are those new roles? What are those new skills? We actually have, um, I'm in touch with the woman who did the, her PhD in systems change. There are specific new roles and skills that are nowhere to be found in our current frameworks. So it's really about engaging um, the transformative participation, bottom up, top down, being able to look very practically at the different case studies um, of systems change efforts in different sectors, in different regions, what is the, the overarching goal of systems change, aligning social and natural systems, what are our interdependent roles to get there, what are the roles, the new roles and skills we need, um, and what are those processes of change, and we're only going to um, highlight those processes of change, um, you know, through doing these case studies, through identifying these new models, these best practices, and having information flows coming from micro, meso, macro, everyday people that, so that we really are not thinking in a silo um, and that we are really engaging transformative participation. Um, so I hope that provides um, some context for the work um, and we're framing it up um, according to Gary Bill, <laughs> Barry Gills put together a, a nice framework for working in this way with new narratives, processes, institutional change. And we can do that very practically through case studies, um, through R&D on, on game-changing innovation, working with arts and culture, all across these as an integrated framework. Um, and Frank, do you want to add anything else? Yeah. It, it, it also emphasizes this, uh, con system change content in, in addition to process. And a big theme that came up was uh, learning from nature and indigenous. So that'll also guide it. What this really shows is the irrepressible enthusiasm of the group. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that we hope we look, that we're counting on to take this project forward. So thank you very much. I'm going to call on one more speaker for this session, because uh, and that and then oh, uh, two more, and then we're going to go on to the closing session on network of networks. So, Elif, uh, hi, hi to uh, all of you. It seems I missed all of you very much. Uh, I it is very exciting what Mila, dear Mila, uh, summarized very nicely to us. Uh, this direct voting uh, project, so bringing more voice of civil society to the UN system. But in line with this, may I have a humble suggestion, just an idea, but we may think on this. It, could it be possible to set up a metric or an index uh, to to list or rank the existential risk that humanity is facing every year um, by the members of academy, because we have more than 700 intellectual, smart, good, uh, full with knowledge people. So every year, once a year, we can conduct a survey and we can rank the most, imp uh, most important ones and share with the uh, media. So perhaps um, some policymakers can think about how they can reduce these uh, risk. So it may appear on Financial Times or The Economist magazine because uh, we have an amazing wealth. I mean, the members of this academy, no need to go outside, just within the academy. Every year, once a year, we can 
ask very simple questions and rank the existential risk that humanity is facing. So because the world is changing very rapidly, so we need to conduct these surveys perhaps every year. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Elif. I take the opportunity to thank you for the tremendous job you've been doing in membership communications, uh, which is which is very challenging. And I to go to the oh, Witold, our last in this session. Very quickly, we had a session on <clears throat> ethics and information, uh, and the um, objective was to look at move the movement from biosphere to global security. Um, in that session, we had uh, a very beautiful um, analysis of what truth is and how to distinguish between information and truth. We looked at uh, various aspects of the modern slavery and how to uh, learn how to break our shackles and moving into the domain that Mila often talks, uh, where uh, the um, knowledge uh, development includes all of the generations, not only those who think that they know, but all of us, an activation of those forces that are dormant and have been dormant for too long. And that is also moving from continuing education to lifelong learning. In that process, we looked how all of those abilities of people uh, could be activated and activated sooner. Um, specifically, R Rodolfo Fiorini, who is a co-organizer of it, talked about how we must move now from uh, quantum, quanta, uh, quantization of things um, that are never good enough to qualia, where quality of living um, implies that our glimpse into understanding of the meaning of life would be a, increased a little bit. And we talked how beautiful role the uh, w World Academy of Art and Science could play in that process. That's a, that's a brief summary. I could talk much longer about it. Thank you. That's an artwork to have summarized that discussion in a few minutes like this. Thank you.